Hello, John Perry here. Welcome to the Stated Clearly Darwin Day Special. I am joining you from the jungles of Ecuador. And if you were to go over the mountains behind me and grab yourself a boat, you could get to the Galapagos Islands, the place where Charles Darwin discovered the process of evolution by natural selection. Today, February 12th, 2019, is Charles Darwin's birthday. If he were still alive, he would be 210 years old. And to celebrate this, we are going to look at some local animals that I was able to film here in Ecuador to help us better understand a phenomena that Darwin discovered called sexual selection. It's a special type of natural selection, and it's often misunderstood. Normally, here on the Stated Clearly channel, I do science animations. I don't do talking head videos like the one you're watching now, but for the past few weeks, I've been in Ecuador working with my friend and tour guide, Nancy Miarelli. She lives here in Ecuador and she is the founder of Cybugs. I'm working with her to set up an Ecuadorian evolution tour that I will start doing next winter. It's a chance for people to escape the cold and come down here to Summerland and learn a little bit of biology. If you're interested in that, shoot me a note from the contact form at statedclearly.com and I'll keep you updated as details solidify. While here in Ecuador, I've also been filming wildlife to be used in videos on my second channel, Stated Casually. If you're not already subscribed over there, I highly recommend doing so. There I film and teach about wildlife. I tour museums, including pseudoscience museums like the Ark Encounter. I have an entire series of videos about that place. And my nephew and I carefully use the scientific method to test the claims made by people on the internet including the claim that alien remains have been discovered at archaeological sites in Peru. There are links to my second channel and the Science vs. the Ark Encounter series in the video description below. So, Darwin's discovery of sexual selection. What exactly is sexual selection? Normally, when we think of evolution, we think of survival of the fittest. Under most conditions, nature only selects for survival. So, if any new trait crops up in a population that makes it harder for those individuals with that trait to survive, maybe it's harder for them to find food or avoid predators and so on, those individuals will likely be outcompeted by their neighbors and the new trait will quickly be eliminated from the population. Usually this is how natural selection works, but in chapter four of Darwin's most famous book, he pointed out that survival alone is not enough. Organisms need to reproduce, and for animals, most of which reproduce sexually, they need to find or attract mates, and if there's competition, they might need to fight off or intimidate rivals for access to the best mates. These needs, the need to attract a mate and to fight off rivals, have produced some of the most bizarre and at first glance, maladaptive traits that we find in the natural world. For example, the long tail of Ecuador's booted racket tail hummingbird seems like a huge burden for the males to carry around, and indeed it is. The females have a much more reasonable tail, far shorter and better suited for survival. What on earth is going on here? How does nature select for something so disadvantageous? To see how these apparently maladaptive traits arise, let's look at the strange case of the fiddler crab. These fiddler crabs live in a large colony on the southern end of Sua Beach in Ecuador, a place that you and I will likely visit together if you ever join me on a tour. There, the crabs filter the sand for microscopic organisms. While the females use both claws for collecting food, the males have one claw that is far too large for feeding. At first glance, this monster claw seems like a horrible adaptation. To make matters worse, they spend a huge amount of energy waving it around all day long as they eat, apparently for no reason. Having one slightly larger claw is normal for crabs of many different species. Males and females often use these large claws for defense. Males also use them to fight off male rivals, gaining better access to females. In most species of crab, the females do not seem impressed by the claw size of males. They do tend to mate more often with large clawed males, but this is not really by choice. Small clawed males simply aren't around to mate because they've been scared off by rivals. In fiddler crabs, scientists believe that in the past something special happened. A random mutation caused a female to be unusually attracted to males with large claws. While we don't understand exactly how mutations and other epigenetic factors affect complex desires like sexual attraction, we have found mutations that seem to dramatically affect the sex drives of animals. 
If a random mutation or epigenetic change happens to make a female more attracted to males with larger claws, in a population of crabs that are already using large claws to fight for females, the mutated female is likely to mate only with males in the population with the largest possible claws. Well, it just so happens that this is good not only for the male's genes, they get to have babies and pass their genes on to the next generation, but it's also good for the female's genes. Her sons are likely to inherit their father's large claw genes, meaning that they will grow up to win more fights and have more babies. And her daughters are likely to inherit her desire for large clawed males, which means that they will have babies that grow up to have more babies than normal, and so on. Statistician and biologist Ronald Fisher realized that if you do the math, once a sexual preference is established in the instinctual minds of a large enough population of females, no matter what that preference is, a positive feedback loop is initiated, driving the exponential evolution of both the desired trait, in this case large claws, and the desire for that trait. An evolutionary explosion then follows. The concept is often called the sexy son hypothesis. In his book, The Selfish Gene, Richard Dawkins writes, in a society where males compete with each other to be chosen as he-men by females, one of the best things a mother can do for her genes is to make a son who will turn out to be an attractive he-man. If she can ensure that her son is one of the fortunate few males who wins most of the copulations in a society where he grows up, she will have an enormous number of grandchildren. The result of this is that one of the most desirable qualities a male can have in the eyes of a female is quite simply sexual attractiveness itself. Now, whenever we see male extravagance, such as in the long tail of a hummingbird or the ridiculously large claw in a fiddler crab, it's likely that in the beginning, the qualities that became attractive to females actually were practical at one point. Once evolution drove those qualities to become sexually attractive to females, natural selection just kept on exaggerating them. So for example, if a male hummingbird has an unusually short tail, that might be a sign of bad health. Maybe there's a nutritional deficiency. Maybe the, the bird's not very good at finding food and that's why it couldn't grow very long tail feathers. Maybe its tail feathers were bitten off by a predator. It's really bad at avoiding predators. So any female that happens to be disgusted by short tails and is attracted to long tails is likely to have children that are better at surviving and reproducing. Once the desire for long tails is established within a population, an evolutionary explosion for long tails follows. As we see with the fiddler crab, the end result of these explosions can be pretty ridiculous. But, silly as they are, they do work. Congratulations, little buddy. Your obnoxiously oversized claw and your absurd dance, as impractical as it all seems, has led you to win the evolutionary prize. Charles Darwin, happy birthday to you, Chuck. Your insights here were far ahead of their time. Before signing off, I should probably point out that not all of the bizarre traits that evolve via sexual selection are the result of females being attracted to extravagance. The female golden silk orb weaver, for example, is easily 10 times larger than the males. The little reddish guy behind her in the web here, believe it or not, is her current mate. While this phenomenon has not been well studied, evidence suggests that gigantism in this case evolved in rebellion toward the male's attempts to control female mate choice. I'm not making this up. There's a very convincing comparative anatomy study that puts forth this case. In contrast to the sexy son hypothesis, this concept is sometimes referred to as the strong independent woman hypothesis. Happy Darwin Day, everybody. John Perry here signing off and saying, as always, stay curious. If you like this video, check out my second channel, Stated Casually, for more videos like this one. If you'd like to join me in Ecuador next winter, escape the snow and run away to Summerland, Nancy is currently negotiating with hotels and specialized tour guides to put together a standard package that will be about 2,500 per person. That's a nine day trip. That includes everything from lodging and food and the specialized tours and tips for all the food and lodging and so on. It does not include your flight to Ecuador, and it doesn't include things like souvenirs and uh, traveler's insurance. Go to statedclearly.com and send me a message telling me that you're interested in learning more.